And what was it like to work with John Hirsch on it? Madness. He was, mm, he, he resigned from the uh, festival on the opening night of Satyricon. Why? But he'd had enough. Enough of the pressures of producing or enough of the board or enough of? Everything, yeah. Because yeah, he had offers, you know, from in Lincoln Center and whatnot. Why should he be worrying? You know, uh, doing things here. You know, it, on his own somehow, almost. You know, you know, we're down there. They're dying. You only need two hundred thousand for a show. Oh, my goodness. Right. Yeah. But you and he had known each other since early fifties. Yeah, I met him when he was, uh, oh gosh, I, I got kicked out of the uh, arts faculty. Uh, I was in Winnipeg, oh gosh, when was that, around 1968. And uh, that's when I started in with uh, accountancy and I had to make a living So You mean 58 or 68? 58, I guess. 58. Because yeah, yeah, 58 is when it was yeah. Theater 77. Yeah. And you and John. Yeah. So how did you and John Hirsch meet? Uh, Adele Wiseman, actually. Uh, well, I met him in the uh, basement of the uh, old arts building in, in Winnipeg. Uh, I was waiting to get a cup of coffee. I only had a nickel. And I turned around. There's this strange looking guy. And I say, uh, I want to get a cup of coffee, and I only have a nickel. Can you lend me two cents? He says, yeah. Good. Thanks very much. Get my coffee and go back with Adele Wiseman. And uh, two days later, I'm in the same place, same guy. He comes over to me and says, I loaned you two cents the other day. Yeah. Can I have it back? <laughs> I thought to myself, this guy's got a future. He's new, but he's got a future. Anyway, then Adele Wiseman finally, uh, this is John Hurt, John Hurt, how do you do, how do you do? And we were all, it used to be, if we'd all been to a play or something, we'd all go to Child's Restaurant at Port Genain in Winnipeg. We were all there, Hirsch was there, going on and on and on and on about how much better Bucharest was, or Budapest was than, than, uh, Winnipeg, which is probably true. <laughs> but uh, anyway. John had come out as a refugee in the late 40s, is that right? He, uh, yeah, that's right. He'd come out, he'd survived the war. His parents had all been killed. Parents his and family. his, his uh, brother. Anyway. And he stayed with the shacks, I believe. He was very lucky with the family. That, uh, right. So and, he was an out of water European. You're artistic right. Jew yeah. who was and in the he, middle of the Canadian prairies in the winter. I mean, I, I cannot imagine John's uh, readjustment and how he actually turned that creative. He was an office boy for an insurance company, Arnovich in Leipzig. Oh and my God. they got him a job there, the shacks. And uh, anyway, uh, when I, I left, uh, by myself uh, that night uh, at uh, Child's, I decided, should I get a streetcar or should I just walk home or what should I do? And uh, he came out of the uh, door of the Child's. And I didn't know the guy. I, trying to think of something to say, you know, what do you say to somebody, you know? The streetcar came along through, and there was uh, what they call uh, heating uh, in Winnipeg, where great big pipes uh, heat, heated big buildings. And there were big plumes of uh, fog, of this central heating stuff. And a streetcar came through this hunk of fog, and I said to him, I was a big uh, film buff at that point, nice shot for a film, hey? And he, I 
thought he was going to faint. I said, are you, are you okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, same place, and I, I said, he said, do you remember, remember first night I met you when Adele, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, why did you say what you said? You know, you said, nice shot for a movie in the streetcar. I said, well, I'll tell you the truth. I mean, I didn't, uh, I wanted to say something to you. I, I, and, uh, I couldn't think of anything to say. And from what you said, you were interested in all kinds of art. So I just said that. Uh, why? And uh, I said, well, I'll tell you sometime. Well, eventually he did. Apparently, when he and his family left Budapest and they were hiding out in a little town with a lot of other Jews from Budapest, somebody must have betrayed them because all of a sudden the Nazis turned up uh, with the Hungarian police and whatnot, arrested all the uh, Jews in town and got them to uh, carry all their furniture to the synagogue uh, because uh, they had a program, the Germans to send home for workers, you know, nice furniture that whose owners didn't, weren't alive anymore. Anyway, they had to pile them all up in the synagogue on heavy things, you know, uh, couches and things like that at the bottom and his older brother who was two days older than me he was a year and two days older than John and uh, he uh, he said uh, uh, my brother was on the top of the pile right near the the ceiling of the synagogue, and the little kids were bringing up little tables and little chairs and things like that, and he was fitting them into this great big pyramid. When Hirsch, when he uh, climbed up this sort of mountain of furniture, placed his uh, little uh, chair, uh, his uh, brother said to him that, uh, the, the German on a certain door looked like a nice guy. When he went back down, he should ask the uh, permission of the soldier on that door to uh, go outside to pee. And then when he got outside, he should take off right away and go to a certain, certain house. The, the people there had been paid to uh, hide him and uh, peroxide his hair so that he would look less Jewish. And uh, above all, not to come back to the synagogue. And uh, anyway, he, he climbed down the furniture. When he looked back up at his brother, who was a big film buff, and there were all these other kids bringing up, uh, you know, small uh, bits of furniture. The brother said to Hirsch, looking at all these kids, you know, with the furniture, hey, good shot for a movie, eh? And I said, really? Yeah. I said, you didn't make it up afterwards? Nope. And John would have been four, five, six at the time? Oh, well, when he, when, no, he was about 11 or 12. Yeah, because when he came to Winnipeg, he was already around 15, 16. And uh, he was about, he was one year uh, younger than I was. And how much do you think his past drove him? I mean, we all remember him as this kind of brilliance, annoying, abrasive, uh, visionary, uh, nonstop, uh, 
all those contradictions. That how yeah. how much is that? Do you think is the past, and what he has lost? Uh, he used to say, you know, why me and not not him? He thought his brother should have survived. And uh, I said, well, all you can say is that uh, you have probably been saved in some way uh, to do something really remarkable with your life. So you better keep that in your mind. That you're not here for an ordinary job or anything. You're here to make a change. Because we certainly owe him and you guys a lot of what happened in Winnipeg and starting that ball rolling. We certainly owe him for CBC drama and what he kick-started CBC drama into ah. the, that era. Yeah. We, we owe him for how he kicked Stratford into a gear. Um, I mean, his legacy and what he put into our country is stunning. However annoying he yeah. was, and he certainly was annoying to me at times, He was I just admired him no end. Yeah. I admired him for how he could talk about the arts, that he could galvanize people by speaking about it. And he would go off to the Kinsman's Club or the This Club, yeah. and he would not essentially berate, but would galvanize them in the importance of what it means to communicate through the arts. I met his, uh, his cousin, who lives in Halifax, or near Halifax, and uh, John used to go uh, there sometimes in the summer, and uh, I said, "What was he like when he was, you know, in your cottage near uh, Halifax and whatnot?" She said he was very, very relaxed, very relaxed, and a real pleasure to have around. Because I, I used to always say to him, "You got to find some way." Turn the switch off now and again, you know? You right. can't be 100 millimeters at all times. And uh, that's the only person I've ever talked to who said that he spent most of his time just quietly talking and so on. Because she was his last remaining uh, relative in the world.